Well, thank you everyone for joining us uh, this evening on this uh, very important uh, town hall meeting. We have a really exciting show for you today uh, with a list of uh, very distinguished panelists uh, who are going to be presenting information on COVID. Our panel today is going to talk about COVID vaccine, uh, both the myth as well as uh, things you can take home to apply in your practice and in your community as well. Uh, I am Chaik Darbeni. I'm a professor of family medicine and internal medicine at the Mayo Clinic. And I lead the Center for Health Equity and Community Engagement Research at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, this uh, uh, panel is being brought to you uh, by a collaborative uh, sponsored by Mayo Clinic and other entities as well. Uh, I want to go through the list of panelists uh, who will then go in sequence to speak briefly about their topics and um, then we'll come back to questions and answers. Uh, I do want to, before I start, remind our audience that as you come in and you listen to the presentation, we encourage you to put your questions um, in a Q&A box or section of the Zoom. Uh, we'll be monitoring that so that at the end of the presentations, we use those questions and comments to then pose questions to the panelists to discuss during this live session. For questions we don't get to, uh, don't have time to get to, we'll try to compile them and share them with you at the end of the session. Again, thank you so much for joining us. First, I will introduce Dr. Lisa Chapatel, uh, who is an Associate Professor of Surgery at Mayo Clinic. Uh, she is trained in critical uh, surgical care and currently serves as the medical director for the Mayo Clinic Hospital in, here in, in Arizona. Uh, importantly, Dr. Chapatel is the hospital incident command leader for the Mayo Clinic in Arizona COVID response. Dr. Chapatel is going to be talking about the risk of COVID-19 infections in priority populations and the available vaccines. Very important information. Good evening. Thank you. I, it's, I feel very privileged to be amongst this group and to be able to uh, give you this information. And I look forward to the question and answer session. So I'll get started because we are only allowed to speak for five minutes and then um, go on to the next person. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about race and ethnicity in the United States. I think um, all of us know that the non-Hispanic white population in the United States represents about 60% of the population where the African American population represents 14 or 13.4% of the population and Hispanic or Latino 18.5% of the population. However, we know that minority populations, particularly African Americans are dying at a disproportionate rate um, I was at a recent um, webinar called Color and COVID, and there was a Dr. Ebony Hilton who said that we are breaking all the wrong records for brown and black people with COVID-19. Black people are dying of coronavirus at an alarming rate that is about 2.5 times higher than other groups. There are over 55,000 African-Americans dead today of coronavirus. That's one in 780 of our population. There are over 60,000 Latinos died and indigenous Americans have a rate of death, a risk of death that is about 2.2 times higher than non-Hispanic white Americans. There are a multitude of implicit biases that have led to that. But I would um, direct you and I can email that a recent study that looked at um, the mortality in minority populations correcting for medical conditions and some social economic differences and the death rates were equal. So this really, really um, has something to do with the social determinants of health. So all the emergency lights should be flashing right now. We should hear sirens, sirens outside because we are at war, right? Air sirens and a prevention is the strongest weapon that we have right now in this war. And right now we're here to discuss vaccination. So we've talked about masking, social distancing, but vaccines are the, the next thing in our armor that we can, um, can um, put on our armor. So 
are Afri African Americans and minorities going to get vaccines? How do African Americans feel about vaccinations? Well, we know currently that African American adults are less likely than white Americans to have ever received a flu vaccine um, or an, a pneumonia vaccine. Um, we do know that in children, there are equal rates, but adults um, are not receiving um, influenza or vaccine. And so we should be alarmed, but should white Americans be alarmed as well? Well, absolutely. If you do the coronavirus math, we need herd immunity in the United States. And I just went over the numbers. We have about 60% of the population that is uh, non-Hispanic white. And if you look at the data, a recent sh study showed that only 68% of that population would be willing to get a COVID-19 vaccine. And so if all of them get a COVID vaccine, that will only get us to about 42% um, to herd immunity. So the nation is relying on the minority population as well to protect them as we need to protect ourselves. And so we'll go a little bit more into the reasons why um, with some of my colleagues um, regarding vaccine hesitancy, but we know that it exists. And that's why we are asking all of you today to be stewards of public health, stewards of our minority population, stewards of our entire nation. And so We'll go to, uh, I'll start introducing um, some of the vaccines that are available and my colleagues who know a little bit more about vaccines uh, can answer further questions, but we have two currently on the market. You all know it's the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine. There were 40 vaccines and there probably are some more, Dr. Bonaclochi can talk about it, um, that were um, in the works. and. We recently heard today that Johnson & Johnson's vaccine is in phase uh, three trial and may be um, uh, on the market very soon. But both the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines are gene-based vaccines that carry the genetic instructions to tell our cells to produce an antigen that is used to fight our immune system. So the vaccines deliver mRNA, so our messenger RNA, and you guys are medical personnel, um, that um, is very novel. This was a very novel virus or a very novel vaccine. Um, and the Johnson & Johnson is a double-stranded DNA um, a vaccine. The point is, is that this, both of those vaccines and this novel way of giving a vaccination and stimulating the immune system has resulted in 90% effectiveness. Uh, over 90% for both of them. One of them has a 95% effectiveness in preventing, preventing symptoms for um, uh, COVID-19. And that's what we are trying to do, prevent clinical symptoms that result in death, hospitalization, and morbidity. The vaccines have been generally well tolerated with few reactions. The reactions that folks are hearing about are the reactions of your immune system being stimulated a little bit of fevers, um, some uh, muscle aches, that type of things. And I think that we have had 9 million people vaccinated in the United States. So we have a big database right now. So we don't know a lot of things about the long-term efficacy of this, but we do know about the safety profile at this time. And so it is our responsibility as uh, um, physicians and providers and community members to get people um, vaccinated, to save lives. And we are working in concert with our public health officials to get this done. And that's why we're here today to answer your questions because you guys are gonna be on the front line answering questions. Um, and so um, I'll go ahead and, the, and uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. And Dr. White is next on the agenda. Well, thank you so much for that excellent presentation to start us off. So next in line is Dr. Richard White. Dr. White is the Assistant Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics at Mayo Clinic in Florida. Uh, of really importance is that he has research interest in diabetes treatment and prevention, which as, as we all know, is one of those high-risk conditions for COVID as well. So he's gonna talk about the importance of ongoing chronic disease management. Amidst the pandemic, 
but also risk communication in support of vaccine uptake in our communities of color. Dr. White. Great, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so glad to be here and thank you, Dr. Chapatal, for those uh, sobering statistics that I think it's really important for us to, to continually reflect on, um, you know, to, to raise the urgency of, of these issues. So um, as Dr. Davani mentioned, um, Richard White, I'm trained as a med peds physician, have the privilege of taking care of both of adults and uh, pediatric patients in our primary care clinic. Um, so my, my research interest uh, does overlap with the impact of health literacy and patient provider interactions and how they impact on chronic disease outcomes, particularly with diabetes. Um, related to COVID, um, I've been involved with standing up one of our uh, COVID testing sites that's been targeting our Latino population here um, in, on the Florida campus and in, in Northeast Florida. Um, and, and early during the pandemic, we were able to pivot some of our community-based work uh, to really respond to what we observed early on as a growing need, particularly among our limited English uh, proficient uh, population to have access to both accurate, timely um, information um, as it related to navigating uh, the pandemic. Um, so some of that work involved uh, increasing our social media presence uh, within the community, um, developing a virtual uh, health, uh, Hispanic health conference, which had some targeted COVID um, information for the community. Um, as well as active efforts to address uh, food insecurity. Early on in the pandemic, we, we realized and through some of our community partners that we work with that food insecurity was a significant issue among a lot of the Hispanics within our region. People were just uh, really worried that they, that they weren't either due to job loss or just um, sort of a scarcity sort of mentality and seeing the grocery stores empty that people wouldn't have access to the food that they need. So we were fortunate to be able to uh, participate in some food drives through some of our community outreach. Um, I'd like to share with you guys just a few thoughts and perspectives on the importance of managing chronic uh, disease amidst the pandemic and really effectively communicating COVID risk to our patients in an effort to address uh, vaccine hesitancy. We all know, as Dr. Chapital uh, mentioned, that um, communities of color suffer disproportionately from many of the chronic conditions that convey increased risk of COVID, uh, of mortality from COVID, so such as diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, obesity, um, and hypertension. And really this along with what we refer to as the social determinants of health has explained really the vast majority of the imbalanced incidence um, of COVID mortality and particularly of hospitalizations. So our practice on the Mayo Clinic Florida campus you know, um, also dealt with uh, significant disruptions of care in the early stages of the pandemic with both uh, seeing both adult and pediatric uh, uh, lapses in, in care. So as we transitioned our practice to telehealth care delivery and, and really were working on trying to ramp back up our practice, um, we, we were concerned um, as primary care physicians that we were going to be seeing a worsening of health maintenance and also chronic uh, disease status with the downstream effect of that uh, theoretically being additional COVID risk for these populations. One of the ways that we addressed, uh, that we responded to this was leveraging our electronic health uh, record and communicating to families that it was both safe um, uh, to resume either virtual or in-person care when in fact it was uh, safe to do so when we were adequately staffed and we had uh, appropriate screening procedures in place. Uh, many of my patients, when they did come back into the clinic, often reported uh, weight gain um, during their isolation, increased alcohol use, increased stress and anxiety, increased depressive symptoms, and just overall fatigue from isolation, um, which I observed to function uh, really as a barrier to effective self-care. Um, back in November, the Pew Research Center uh, reported that 83% of Asians, 63% of Hispanics, 61% of whites, and only 42% of Blacks reported that they, they would either definitely or probably get the vaccine. So in light of some of the statistics that we've heard already, um, this definitely concerns me a lot. Um, now, I just actually got my second dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, uh, vaccine yesterday, and I did today sort of have to push through clinic because of some uh, mild to moderate uh, symptoms. And we've heard already that, you know, uh, um, over half of the patients are reporting some type of symptoms. So I think the transparency with our patients in discussing that is important. Um, I think it's also important that we use all the strategies that are uh, communication strategies at our disposal to help patients and especially patients of color navigate through their questions and their concerns to help them filter through misinformation and truly make informed decisions with regards to their vaccine status. So I'll end with just some key effective communication strategies that I've personally used um, with my patient. That includes doing my best to communicate in plain language and focusing on just a few topics at a time during their encounters, 
trying to use patient-friendly uh, education materials and directing people to lower literacy resources, um, using teach-back technique to ensure effective communication, and then really lastly, just not being afraid to uh, share my personal experience and common points of anxiety that I share with my patients um, during the pandemic and leveraging my trust, uh, their, their trust in me as their provider to filter misinformation around vaccine uptake. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. White. That is really an excellent follow up from Dr. Shapital's presentation. Um, so also thank you so much for talking about your experience with the vaccine because that's something that's on the minds of everybody. I participated in the clinical trials and on Monday I'll find out which arm I belong, but I'm gonna start the vaccination or not. Thank you so much for letting me know that. Next, I'm really pleased to, to introduce Dr. Francisco Moreno. Dr. Moreno is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Arizona, uh, but also importantly is associate vice president at the University of Arizona Health Sciences Center uh, in the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. Dr. Moreno works in the area of diversity, cultural uh, proficiency, and community congruence of health services and research in uh, priority populations and health issues. Uh, he's going to talk about vaccination misinformation, uh, which is really, really important. Uh, it's a national issue right now. Dr. Moreno, take it away. No. Hello. Hi. Sorry about that. I was muted. Uh, mistake number one of the Zoom uh, era, so I apologize for that. Thanks again uh, for the invitation to participate today, and thanks to all of you that have joined us uh, in the audience today. We know how valuable your time is uh, here. Um, I was asked to say a little something about our collaboration with the SEAL program, which is the, uh, is the uh, Community Engaged Alliance Against COVID-19. It's an NIH-funded effort uh, that's a wonderful example of collaboration among institutions here in our state that uh, Mayo Clinic uh, uh, is included with Dr. Duboni uh, being a, a principal investigator on that as well. Uh, people from the University of uh, Arizona State, uh, Northern Arizona and the U of A in, in uh, Tucson as well. Uh, and the main goal is to make sure that we do community engaged research to be able to really gauge uh, perceptions that people have of, uh, uh, of COVID transmission, uh, uh, get a better appreciation for their understanding and their willingness to participate in, in research and perhaps prevention activities such as receiving the vaccination. And an important element that is uh, particularly impactful among uh, disadvantaged communities and marginalized communities um, is uh, the issue of trust. Uh, as we, um, uh, Dr. Duboni had mentioned, uh, uh, trust for vaccine uh, data, the relevance of vaccination, the, um, uh, the, uh, the likelihood of pursuing being vaccinated and, um, is something that uh, unfortunately also Dr. White shares the numbers of some of the underrepresented groups in our country uh, those groups, uh, the ones that are most likely to be affected with COVID, to have greater rates of admissions and mortality, are among the communities that are at least likely, based on their, in, uh, their own report, to participate in vaccination. We're not only talking about vaccination trials, but we're talking about actual vaccination. And so um, it becomes an important priority for us to make sure that we are able to work with uh, uh, all stakeholders, and of course, uh, having an opportunity to interact with uh, clinicians and care providers, uh, your role is essential at allowing us to really be able to connect with the community members, uh, be able to really demystify a lot of the conceptions that are inaccurate, and perhaps cement a little bit more about that um, uh, commitment towards uh, making sure that we participate in this sort of uh, uh, general approach towards the prevention of ourselves and the, to take care of our families and the members of our communities as well. Um, we believe that um, it is uh, very important to make sure that, um, that we do that um, through people that can be trusted by uh, the patients, the members of the community that are healthy, but perhaps need to be advised a bit more about um, how to prevent and how to advance our ability to fight COVID. Um, 
And um, many times, even us as providers are not always uh, the most likely individual to be impactful. So we ask you to enroll uh, your team members, if you have uh, any extenders of your activities, your nursing staff, your MAs, uh, your front desk uh, personnel, uh, if you work with community health workers or other individuals that really have the ear and the trust of the members of, of the community to continue that dialogue, to allow us to learn some more so that we can continue to develop strategies that will allow us to have more of an impact with, with individuals. I was very pleased to hear that uh, Dr. Dubene, Dr. White have themselves participated in vaccination. I was also part of the um, Moderna vaccine trial. Uh, unfortunately, I got the placebo and I have a few other consequences after being exposed and different things like that. Very good experience with the vaccine. I wish I had gotten the real stuff early on um, and uh, um, very uh, pleased to have been now vaccinated with the real good stuff and uh, uh, looking forward to continuing to share my experience and other people's experiences with this particular issue. So thank you again, Dr. Dubini. Thank you, Francisco Moreno. So, so this is really interesting because um, if I could take just a, a minute to share with, it, with our audience. Uh, we have collected some data in the steel initiative and I'll tell you this. Um, this is data that is uh, coming out of one of our centers because it's preliminary. I'm not gonna give you the name of the center, but I'll tell you this. Less than 50% of the people who were surveyed said they were very likely or likely or very likely to receive the vaccine. And for those who said they were likely to receive the vaccine, their reason for getting it included, I want to keep myself safe, my family safe, but also my community safe. So those were motivations for getting the vaccine, wanting to get a vac vaccine. Those who said they were not gonna get a vaccine, um, not very surprising. They were concerned about side effects from the vaccine. I don't know enough about the vaccine, how well it works. And it's one of the other reasons. One reason that really worries me, a small number of people though, is that I don't want to pay for it. So keep in mind about concerns about costs as people come to your clinics uh, to see you and as you communicate with them, these are potential underlying reasons and for some of the reasons you've seen already, keep some of these other things in mind as well as you discuss and share with your patients about the importance of vaccination. Um, next, I'm really pleased to um, welcome Dr. Porter. Dr. Porter is an assistant professor of medicine and vice chair of the division of nephrology and hypertension at Mayo Campus in Florida. Is more importantly, is the chair of the Mayo Clinic Florida's community engagement committee, medical director of the office of access management and serves in leadership of the internal medicine residency program. Dr. Porter is going to speak about who should get vaccinated, herd immunity, and all that fun stuff. All right, let's go to Dr. Porter. I think the population in general has fears about getting administered a brand new COVID vaccination and what could be, but I just want to stress that that level of normal that everybody wants to have will not be attained if we don't have broad acceptance of this vaccination uh, and what that can bring to the population and population health in general. Yeah, it's uh, uh, my pleasure and really a, a great privilege to be able to speak with everybody today. I am um, uh, very happy to be involved. Um, in my role in community engagement, we co coordinated a number of uh, community COVID testing. Um, you, you saw the video that we were just attempting to play was me receiving the first vaccine um, at Mayo Clinic. And I also received my second dose this week. Um, you know, I often speak to the importance of annual vaccinations in general, uh, such as the flu vaccine. So it's perfect for me to talk about debunking myths with vaccines. Uh, I am often telling people, no, you did it not, in fact, get the flu from your inactivated flu vaccine. So this is just, you know, this is more par for the course. It's just uh, uncharted territory, if you will. Um, you know, I work with COVID patients directly in the aspects of chronic kidney disease, kidney disease in the hospital and in our dialysis populations. And I also have interest in health disparities. Um, my wife was involved in the Moderna trial, got the placebo and um, did end up getting uh, the vaccine through her job as well. Um, you know, one of the first things that I think about is how, just as with anything that we do, this is all about partnerships and how we communicate with our patients. 
Um, this vaccine is really no different. Um, it's not our job to force or insult someone for not doing as we think is appropriate, but we need to educate and try to, again, attain that partnership to allow them uh, to make what we consider are the right decisions. Um, you know, often I hear that uh, this is brand new, this was rushed, we don't know anything about this vaccine, and people don't understand the history, the, the you know, multiple decades of, of um, actual research that's been done towards this, and just how we were able to stick in the information from the coronavirus and the spike protein in order to be able to do this. So, you know, speaking to that, speaking to the members at the NIH that are at the head of this virology department, the African-American uh, female physician that's in charge of this, that her boss who has an African-American wife whose uh, mixed race daughter was also in the Moderna trial as well. I mean, I think knowing those details do help to build those, uh, build the trust that we've been talking about that we have to do um, in order to get broader adoption of uh, this vaccination. You know, another thing I usually speak to is more, you know, when we talk about being rushed, the differences are just simultaneous trials versus sequential trials. And while we have tested safety, we have tested efficacy, that's how we have the data that we have. We don't know durability and how long things last. That's one of the many unknowns that we have to deal with and try to get our patients to accept. There, well, there's always fear of the unknown. And it's our job to try to bring that, to bring that into perspective and to try to see if we can calculate those risks so we can help our patients make calculated risks. Um, you know, when we think about who should be getting vaccinated, um, honestly, sometimes our state guidelines may not help us. There may be, they may add the confusion, but again, we have to focus on what we do know and we have to focus on the guidelines for where we live. So of course, the Committee for Immunization Practices is going to state, uh, they're gonna make recommendations for who should get vaccinated. But you know, if your state says you gotta be 70, then you, you gotta be 70. Uh, but we want everybody that's 70 to get it. Uh, same thing. I and mean, when they open it up to 65, we just have to, okay, well, you're 65, get in there and get it. Uh, that needs to be our role, in my opinion. You know, we've talked a little bit about, you know, a few of us have brought up herd immunity. And honestly, deep on the inside, I feel it's irresponsible to even talk about herd immunity. Um, why do I say that? I mean, populations that have tried, herd, tried a, a process of herd immunity have not been successful. Furthermore, uh, populations that we've seen that have a high prevalence rate of the disease, uh, they still have very effective community spread. I don't think that's a strategy. Furthermore, I mean, uh, if we just think about our own country, we travel broadly. There's lots of freedom here to be able to go wherever you want, and we like that. So to be able to think that we can wall ourselves off and not have to worry about uh, the safety of those around us and those that we travel to and the countries that we go to, honestly, it's irresponsible. And furthermore, uh, maybe most importantly, we have to remember that not everyone can receive a vaccination safely. So we have to worry about the burden on hospitals. It's really in the best interest for us to um, get as many of these people to be vaccinated as possible. And to speak just a little bit, you know, Dr. White talked about statistics. Dr. Chapital also talked about some of the disparities. But if we think about the differences between um, you know, the minority populations being affected two to three times worse for infection rates, uh, the um, how hospitalizations, um, deaths. If this population does not receive vaccinations, will that be six, seven times more than the population come next year? Those are the things that we need to try to avoid, accepting what we don't know, using what we know. And hopefully that's going to get us to a point that everyone that can receive the, the immunization safely will get the immunization. Thank you. Thank you so much. Loud and clear. Get vaccinated. Get everyone vaccinated. Don't rely on herd immunity. This is our responsibility to do it. Thank you so much, Dr. Porter. Uh, before we move to Dr. Uh, Benacucci, who is going to share with us uh, with his expertise from the F FDA, let me give you a little bit more information from that same survey um, about trusted sources of information. Number one, your doctor or healthcare provider. So it's a really big responsibility for us as uh, sources of trusted information for our patients and our communities. Next one, your faith leader. And so uh, going back to Dr. Porter's point, uh, it's really important for us to think about partners in our communities who we can work with 
to create trust in our community. And that's one of the things that the SEAL initiative is doing. But of course, these engagements only work if we have effective partnerships. I'm really pleased to introduce to you uh, Dr. Benaclucci, who is um, uh, one of the uh, um, physicians at Mayo Clinic. He's an infectious disease physician. Um, he's a unique breed of people, and particularly important at this time when we're dealing with such a pandemic. Uh, he has expertise in immunology and immunocompromised patients, and this is really important, and we're pleased to have him here. He was on the at the table uh, at the FDA advisory committee that recommended emergency use of uh, these vaccines for both Pfizer and the Pfizer vaccine. So first-hand information and knowledge about this. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Benacloche. Thank you. Thanks Thank you for me. the introduction and for the <clears throat> For the for having me today, um, I think the the things that are important to know about the vaccine authorization process is that it has been really been transparent. I don't know um, how well you you have to convey that to to your patients. Um, the FDA in October issued guidance for the industry saying uh, whoever wants to develop a vaccine for um, for COVID that, that is going to apply for the <clears throat> emergency use authorization, the EUA, these are the, the things that they need to do. And th that includes not only saying that the, there has to be a phase uh, three trial of efficacy in enough patients. It's also, it also includes things how, um, how, uh, how the vaccine is going to be produced, how it's gonna be synthesized, what are the, the quality controls to ensure that there's not going to be lot to lot variation? A lot of data that it, those, those data are those recommendations are public. Anybody can see them. They were um, presented way in advance, so the, the pharmaceutical companies knew what they had to do to apply. Then the, the issue of um, of approval of the vaccine from the beginning in that document, they said we will convey a panel of experts from FDA personnel and outside experts to discuss uh, uh, its vaccine. Um, for an emergency use authorization, the, the basic criteria is based on the evidence that we have today, uh, we believe that the benefit of the vaccine outweighs the risk. So that is what, what an emergency use authorization is, it's different from when a vaccine or a, or a medicine gets licensed, with, which re, you know, it requires um, less of a, of a threshold. So to, to get licensed, we need longer term data. And you know, that's an issue in this uh, situation because now that we have enough data for the emergency use, um, people who were enrolled in a trial that was uh, supposed to last two years, and now they find that they were getting the placebo and there's a, a vaccine that is effective, what do we do with them? Do we keep them in the trial for another two years? But we will need that to finally license the vaccines. Uh, clearly, we have enough information right now on the uh, vaccines by Moderna and Pfizer to say that they are extremely effective and that they seem to be very safe. They seem to be very safe has the caveat that we only have two months worth of uh, data after the second dose. Uh, but the truth is that based on what we know about other vaccines, there is plenty of time to find adverse effects related to vaccine, real adverse effects really related to vaccines. No conspiracy theories about long-term effects of, of, uh, of vaccines. So overall, I think that the, the general idea is the, the vaccine has been, um, the, the, the discussions, the open sessions, have been shown on, on TV through C-SPAN. Anybody could see them. The, the members, the panelists, when they are, when we're doing this, we have to become temporary federal employees and have no conflict of interest or appearance of conflict of interest. So the, the panelists or their, or their uh, partners cannot have, um, say, stocks on Pfizer or Moderna or any other company that, that they could get some benefit from choosing one, one thing or another. So it's a very stringent process. Uh, the people who are involved take their job very seriously um, and they are actually quite 
carefully monitor to make sure that uh, that they do the right thing. Thank you so much uh, for that um, very helpful um, presentation and explanation. So now we're into the, can you all hear me okay? Okay, now we're into the um, Q&A session and uh, please uh, um, share your questions uh, through the Q&A link. We have three questions already. Um, of course, I'm gonna take the prerogative as the panel chair to ask uh, my first question. And I'm going to turn it first to Dr. White. Uh, Dr. White, you talked about some of the methods or approaches you use to motivate people who may be on the fence about um, getting the vaccine. Um, can you share a little bit about somebody who will tell, who will, tell, who will come to your office and tell you that, you know, Doc, I've heard this vaccine is um, a bit of a sham. You know, it's, it's rushed to the clinic, to, to the clinic, and I'm not a guinea pig. I'm not going to get it. What would you tell that person? Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Dominic, for that question. So, you know, I have seen uh, quite a spectrum of responses to offering of the vaccine. Uh, to one end of the spectrum, one of my patients, when I mentioned the availability of the vaccine, you know, viscerally became irritated and, you know, made it very clear at the beginning that I am not getting that vaccine. And, you know, it was clear that this was, you know, being driven by really a distrust um, of, 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 of the system. Um, you know, unfortunately, since the discussions have been so politicized, you know, a lot of the, the patients that are coming to see us, you know, really are, are that's the motivating factor. Um, you know, for other patients that, you know, are, are hesitant, you know, I try to, to delve into what some of the resistance, what the, the etiology of that, and a lot of times it's because of misinformation or really just because of, because of fear. You know, so you have an opportunity to, you know, gauge, engage in a conversation with the individual and really try to dissuade some of those some of those fears by sharing with them, you know, in in layman terms, you know, as best as you can, the, the information that we've highlighted here with, with among our among our panelists, the fact that you know m minority patients were involved in the in the trials, and that there's there's good data showing that the, the vaccine is effective and that it's and that it's safe. And like I mentioned at the end, you know, also sharing personal anecdotes about my own experience with the vaccine, I think can help to leverage that trust that we have in patients. Thank you. I've also found that. Uh... One of the ways I've been partially successful in addressing some of those concerns, I would say, well, I was a guinea pig in the trial. <laughs> I, you know, I'm not sure if I got the placebo or the real thing I find out on Monday, but I, I think having received the vaccine established some level of credibility. And, and it's also to Dr. Marino's point, important to share with them about your own personal misgivings, because I think transparency with patients uh, can also build trust. Uh, with them. And actually, while we're on it, Dr. White and any other person on the panel can answer. Uh, this question comes from uh, Starks. Um, you mentioned doctors and providers are the most trusted source of information. Can anyone share examples of conversations with African Americans and Latino patients, which resulted in easing their hesitation about the vaccination? Any specific conversation that anyone of you remember? Richard, uh, Ivan? I can speak to one, uh, Dr. White, and then I'll let you um, Go ahead, uh, weigh in. Um, I actually, I, I spoke a little bit about uh, talking about an African-American uh, woman physician virologist being the one at the NIH. And, you know, I, so I always speak to Dr. Corbett, actually. I speak to her and I speak to the other members that were at the table and their family members being involved in the trial. Um, so besides myself saying myself and being able to share something like a video of myself receiving the vaccination, um, that's really the way that I try. Um, honestly, we have to see what that true barrier is. So th this is us usually multi-layered. When we talk about trust, you know, we can talk about police, we can talk about financial institutions, we can talk about physicians and the history, but truly getting at what is that barrier, what is, what is it that makes them so apprehensive? Um, if you can speak to that and then try to speak to that direct, or if you can um, illustrate that and then try to speak to it directly, I feel like that's the best I've done. You know, I did this at a barber shop. Um, there are three barbers at my barber shop, and um, none of them were interested in the vaccine. And then I talked about it after I got my first dose, and they saw my arm didn't fall off. Um, 
And I have convinced the owner of the barbershop that once they allow essential workers like barbers to get vaccines, he's going to be there. My barber still is not on board, but I work on them every day, every week. Every time I'm in there, I'm working on them. So um, I really think it's about trying to make that connection, figure out exactly what it is that needs to be addressed. I mean, honestly, uh, that's going to be the most important thing. It's really and, important uh, and powerful. Go for it, Dr. White. Yeah, great, great response, Dr. Porter. I agree with that. You know, I would just share just really quickly that, you know, we're, our primary care practice is being inundated on a daily basis with uh, messages through patient portals. And a lot of the challenges that we're facing right now is just really managing expectations um, with regards to, to vaccine availability, um, specifically to respond to, you know, some of my minor minority patients. You know, sometimes the hesitancy is just as simple as clarifying with someone that there's not a cost associated with receiving the vaccine, aside from potentially some administrative, administrative costs. Um, you know, and as Dr. Porter was saying, you know, I've uh, put pictures of myself on our on our Facebook uh, page, on you know LinkedIn, you know, trying to show visibility of you know physicians of color that are receiving this, you know, to to help uh, ease um, hesitancy. Um, we have a Hispanic advisory board that we work with some of our community engagement research and. One of our um, very vocal um, Hispanic leaders, you know, uh, came to, he's a Mayo patient and he came uh, to receive his vaccine and he did a very, just really quick short video that we've been able to post on our Facebook page and, you know, really just helping to, to, to normalize um, the vaccine process for people I think is really helpful. Yeah, one thing that I would like to add uh, in that regard is that in both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, 25% of the participants identify themselves are as uh, Hispanic or Latino and nine and a half percent as uh, uh, African Americans. So the, 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 the Hispanic population is a little bit overrepresented and the, 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 the African American population a little bit underrepresented with the, compared to the general population of the United States. But clearly they participated in the, in the vaccines and there was no uh, indication at all that there were either more side effects or less efficacy. So they, they had the same response as, uh, as the majority of the uh, participants who were white. This is a very important point, so I'm gonna keep it open. Uh, Dr. Chapital, I think you unmuted yourself. I am just going to reinforce that point because that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, reinforce that we have to be the example. Be the example, get your vaccination, and, um, and um, protect yourself, be the example and educate everyone. So you have to figure out those details that are causing some uh, vaccine hesitancy and provide that information. And so even if it's not in your area, you know, I'm a bread and butter uh, general surgeon, had to get that information and try to understand what's an mRNA vaccine, but explain to folks that yes, these vaccines were tested in people who look like you. Yes, there is safety. Yes, I uh, believe that it is safe and I am taking it and I'm concerned about you. So be that example. And, and actually you brought up uh, an important point that I believe has been in the uh, chat box about uh, potential for autoimmune reaction or, or health issues to the vaccine, uh, given that it's a, a messenger RNA um, vaccine. Anyone can address that point? One maybe? Yeah, I think that the, the, um, there are a couple of concerns there. One uh, concern is that um, the vaccine is very strong, very immunogenic, if you want. Um, after the second dose, uh, more than, than half the recipients of the second dose will experience systemic symptoms like uh, fatigue or headache. Um, and a, a, a large percent of people will develop lymphadenopathy. So there is a very strong uh, um, interferon response in the vaccine. And so there is some concern about whether that may trigger some autoimmunity. This is not related to the to the mRNA part that I will address in a minute, but just to the fact that there's a very, it's a very strong vaccine. Uh, we know that patients with rheumatologic conditions that were stable after having received um, biologicals, they were included in the in the trials and they didn't show any more toxicity. But that is that is an issue that one needs to to keep in mind. Now the question about what happens with the mRNA is that it's not supposed to last there forever. 
and so the mRNA um, should be degraded after a few days and is not expected to remain, is not, we don't know of a mechanism by which the mRNA in the vaccine would integrate in the in the genome and stay there forever. So one can speculate as, as much as one wants, but really there, is, there are no data supporting uh, long-term uh, autoimmunity with mRNA vaccines. Now, the potential for autoimmunity in, in, in vaccines that elicit a very strong interferon response that exists, and that is something that we may see in the future. Thank you. And actually, while you're still on the spot, um, one, if you would, a patient, um, this is a question on the Q&A, a patient got the vaccine with a different mechanism, such as the Oxford one, and um, uh, which it is theoretically has a low effectiveness. So can they also get the Pfizer vaccine or Moderna vaccine? And in the same vein, can a person who developed antibodies and received the vaccine still donate plasma for monoclonal treatment? Right, so those those are two questions in the Q&A, and uh, I think that they reflect a little bit <clears throat> one of the issues that is very important, particularly when we um, answer questions, we are put on the spot and we, we like to answer, but the truth is that for many things, when we don't know, we just have to say we don't know. And, uh, you know, um, the, the second question about whether you can donate plasma. And, and please keep in mind that plasma is one thing and monoclonal antibodies is a different thing. So when you give plasma, you give all the antibodies that you have in the plasma. And, you know, when you give a monoclonal antibody, you are giving one antibody. Or if you are giving a combination of two monoclonal antibodies, you are giving two. You know, in reality, when you have natural, you, when you develop your natural immune response to the virus, you have a multitude of antibodies. You have antibodies against the spike protein. You have antibodies against the nucleocapsid. You have antibodies against many, many things. So in the plasma, there are many more antibodies than in the monoclonal antibodies, albeit probably at a lower concentration. Now, um, the idea of I didn't get the infection, but I got the vaccine. Now, can you get my plasma and my plasma can be effective as the monoclonals are? Um, that is a theoretical question, but without data, you really cannot answer. So the, the, the antibodies that you develop when you get the vaccine are antibodies directed against the, the spike protein because the spike protein is the, the part of the virus that is encoded by the mRNA that you gave. You are not developing any response whatsoever against other parts of the virus. <laughs> and so um, theoretically, I would, I would imagine that the plasma of someone who has had the infection will be a, a better product to give to someone who is infected than the plasma of somebody who has just received the vaccine. Not because the level of antibody against the spike protein is different. In fact, the, the levels of antibody against the spike protein is higher in, patient, in patients who've received the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine than in, in patients who actually had the infection. But the fact is that you are lacking antibodies against any other part of the virus. And I don't know why that particular product would be better than, than plasma from somebody who has had the whole gamut of antibodies against the virus because they, they had to fight the virus and, and overcome it. Thank you so much. There's a lot for us to learn, uh, but the answer is um, there's no reason why you cannot donate uh, plasma. Um, so there's a question in the chat here. So it's about the so we're sort of flipping the table here. So we're talking about the trusted sources of information, but it's about where can you go to find information um, about COVID and the vaccine? And this is sort of fluid information is rapidly changing. Today is one thing, one B, tomorrow is one C, and how do you keep track of this? Um, the um, Samantha Espinoza suggested the CDC website as one. Um, what, where, where do you guys look for information on COVID vaccine and vaccination. Let's start with uh, Francisco. Uh, the county health departments um, have been instrumental in supporting the distribution in a number of the states. And um, so uh, for that reason, I would say, uh, depending on where you're at, looking at the State Department of Health or the County Department of Health, 
um, I found those those are easier to translate all over the country than than um, than other sources. Uh, whatever people get their health care, most people have been pretty good at at putting up information as to where to obtain this. And as uh, there's a rollout plan that may or may not be well implemented, but as as the different uh, communities start to be um, uh, included, then there's the communications that are going to be also trying to target those specific communities that are now due for for the uh, for the active vaccination. But I would, again, uh, county health department is it's a pretty safe bet all over the country. Are this? Yep, and I would add to that. I mean, absolutely. I get my information um, from a multitude of sources, depending on what I'm I'm looking for. And so, um, we we have to have a plug for Mayo Clinic um, because Mayo Clinic org as well has information um, for uh, lay persons as well as medical providers, which I think is very good. The county health websites let you know really what's um, available in your area. Um, it tried to give you some uh, information regarding uh, demographics, which I think is a little bit helpful, but uh, the CDC has a little bit more information regarding demographics for the entire state. I'm sorry, the entire nation. However, with that said is a lot of that information was not provided in the beginning and so it's not entirely accurate. Um, but our medical societies have um, really worked very hard to gather information. Um, AMA has information and they have um, a group on their uh, Blacks uh, um, uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID task force, which I think is um, uh, fairly uh, good. Um, it needs to be up to date, but there's lots of information out there. Thank you. And, and certainly the CDC uh, provides a lot of the information that sets the tone for many of the local information. Uh, for instance, in Arizona, the Arizona Department of Health has information that's updated on a regular basis, and I'm pretty certain it's the same thing in Florida as well. Um, but the local distribution information are going to be very state specific and county specific to Dr. Moreno's point. And, and but personally, what I where I get my information from most of the time is either from the state website or the CDC website. And those are safe bets for me. Um, but sometimes the news is also a very important source of information because there might be a lag. But the physician, of course, is a safe source of information. There is a question here um, that um, we were going to ask later, but we're also coming up against the clock. So I'll pose it now. Uh, Ashish Patel asks, how adequate is the efficacy of the Pfizer-based vaccine? And you could say the symptom of the Moderna vaccine after the first dose, before the second, and how long it typically takes to develop proper immunity after receiving the second dose. Anyone wants to take it? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to take that. Um, based on efficacy, which is the question, mm -hmm. the efficacy seems to be just as good after the first dose than after the second dose. Um, the vaccines, both the Moderna and the, the, the Pfizer vaccine, they show that they reduce the uh, incidence of uh, symptomatic COVID-19 as early as day nine after the administration. And there is no evidence in the efficacy data that the second dose increases the efficacy. The second dose is supposed to prolong the duration of the immunity. And this is based not on, on lab tests, not on, on blood tests that you do to measure antibodies or to measure immunity. This is, I'm talking about efficacy. So the efficacy of the first dose and the second dose, they seem to be the same. The question is that we don't know how long the immunity to, to COVID would last if we gave only one dose, but the one dose would be effective. We, we know that because those data have been analyzed both in the, in the Moderna and the Pfizer. And really the question is, um, can I give these vaccines any other way? And that's the reason you are having different answers in different countries about that particular conundrum. 
because you think, well, maybe it's okay to wait instead of instead of giving the Pfizer at three weeks, maybe I can give it at four weeks or five weeks and still get uh, pretty much the same bang for my buck. And, uh, and the, you know, in the United Kingdom, they have decided to go that route. But the truth is that we don't know how long you can delay the second dose. And that is the reason the FDA has advised, don't do that, just follow the instructions the way they were studied, which is absolutely the more uh, prudent and more conservative way of looking into that. Yes, and, and in primary care, it's uh, not uncommon that uh, someone walks in through your door two or three months after receiving the first dose and you have to sort of ask, should I restart this series? Uh, the current information I have is that you don't need to restart the series, just give a second dose um, and then you're good to go. So there's no need at this point in time to restart the series. But of course, please uh, do check the information. The information may come from the ASIP um, and um, that may change the guidance on this question. Any additional responses from the panelists on to those uh, questions? Just one comment. The FDA website is a frequently overlooked, um, extremely valuable source of information with uh, information about the vaccines, information about the meetings, information about everything with documentation, both in English and in Spanish, and very frequently the minutes of, of, the, of the meetings. So everything is there. And we, we don't think about that, but the same way that the CDC or the NIH are the places, the CDC for everything and the NIH for treatment, if you are interested in the, in the approval or the authorization of something, the FDA, FDA.gov is an excellent site to find everything you, you may want to know. This is also a very important question uh, coming from Sam Ferris. If I get that wrong, please don't be upset. Um, uh, there is some concern in regards to pregnancy. Can you speak to the safety of the vaccine for pregnant women? And actually in the same general question, I'm gonna add a follow-on question from Melinda Henry. Who is not a candidate for the vaccine? Because like pregnant women were excluded from the trials, we don't have information on pregnant women or children. And in fact, that is the, the priority in the, in the new studies that are taking place. So we really cannot answer. Um, because women did get pregnant during the trials and nothing happened. Um, someone may look at that information and say, based on what we know, we think that in pregnant women, still the benefit probably outweighs the risk, but no one can say that because we don't have the data. And in fact, different experts in that situation may come, with, may come up with completely opposite answers. The truth is that that is a group that was explicitly excluded from the trials for these vaccines. And that means we really don't know. And uh, again, the important one important piece of information that you shared um, is that there are now trials in those populations. We will encourage all of you to encourage your patients to participate and volunteer in those trials because that is the only way we will know how these vaccines will work in those populations. And of course, it's really important that for any of these trials, we have a diversity of participants because we need to know the effectiveness of vac vaccines in various situations in African-American populations, Latino populations, Native American populations, and people in various occupations and situations. And of course, the schools are an important test area or test ground for all of this. Ivan, it looks like you want to make a point. Yes, one quick comment. I will state that my wife is an OBGYN. I told you that she was involved in the Moderna trial. So clearly she is a proponent for vaccinations. She's telling all of her patients to get vaccinated. Where, uh, however, I have a friend who went to their OBGYN and was told the exact opposite. I only bring this up to you know, reiterate your point that people are being given different information. And that is because we don't know. A lot of our information ends with, if you have a question, ask your doctor, but your doctor may not have the right answer, which goes to my point of focusing on what we do know, focusing on the risks that we have calculated and trying to help that make educated decisions. Really important point, Ivan. This is really important. Uh, other panelists to that point? 
again, the importance of participating in clinical trials. I cannot overemphasize that. Um, I'm hoping that actually these events can also turn around that trust in research because uh, we many times lack the information we need, the evidence we need in, a, in our communities that are most affected by these health conditions, even besides COVID. Um, Dr. White, you talked about the importance of chronic disease care during this pandemic. And of course, there are concerns out there about the pandemic leading to a tsunami potentially of potentially preventable illnesses and death, which I suspect could disproportionately affect the same communities that are impacted by COVID. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, it's definitely, um, as I mentioned briefly earlier, something that's definitely concerning. Um, you know, with, I, I recall looking at a article that was published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism that looked at the uh, severity of um, COVID mortality among patients with diabetes. And obesity um, in that particular analysis explained up to about 50% of the attributable risk um, to mortality um, in patients with diabetes. And we know that the obesity, you know, sort of epidemic within our, our country likely is, has worsened uh, during, during the pandemic. You know, I mentioned earlier that a lot of my patients that are coming in are, are you know, almost tongue in cheek, you know, saying, you know, the, in 2020, you know, was the, the 20 extra pounds that I gained during isolation and, and pandemic, um, during the pandemic. And, you know, so there, there's concern for certain um, about worsening uh, chronic disease management. You know, we've tried to emphasize to our patients, you know, when, when it was safe for patients to come back into the clinic, um, that they take advantage of those opportunities, leveraging um, telehealth opportunities to address uh, individuals' chronic health needs, making sure that their medications were refilled on a timely, on a timely fashion, um, and bringing people into the clinic because chronic disease management is something that needs to occur whether we're, we're in isolation or, or whether we're not. Um, and so that, that is an ongoing issue um, that, we're, that we're addressing. So you know, I, I think that that communication with the patients to help them to understand that, that they potentially can lower the risk by ensuring that at least the chronic diseases that they do have are optimally managed um, and continuing, you know, to follow other safety guidelines until uh, the vaccine, till their turn comes up for them to, to get their vaccine. You know, I, I think it's important too, to clarify with patients that um, the algorithms that are being used for deciding how the vaccine is being distributed takes in consideration age and a multiplicity of, of factors. And to help patients to, to understand that, um, you know, that those, uh, what, that their risk is being taken into consideration because I'm getting patients, uh, husband and wife uh, pair that are coming in and saying that husband's been notified that he's, his turn is up for the shot. Why hasn't the wife gotten it? And, you know, so a lot of it is just sort of managing expectations, but emphasizing always that it's just um, uh, critical to, to continue to optimize uh, chronic disease management care. Thank you so much. Uh, this is uh, another question in Q&A. Um, this is a really important question. Uh, it's about getting COVID vaccine around at the same time around the same time as other vaccines. I will tell you as a trial participant, I was asked not to get the flu vaccine within two weeks of my COVID shot. And after the two weeks, I got my COVID shot. But we'll have to turn this over to the panelists uh, to weigh in on the timing of the vaccine versus other vaccines. Because the trial setting is very pure setting and I don't know the reason why you shouldn't get other vaccines. Uh, but this is all new and to Dr. Um, Kloch's point, a lot of it we don't know. One, you unmuted yourself, go for it. Yeah, I think that in the in the setting of a trial, particularly when you are looking for toxicity of your product, yeah. you don't want to um, get noise in the results. So if you get a, the flu shot and you get fever because of the flu shot, and it has been in, in immediately around the time that you got your COVID shot, you don't know what of, which one of the two shots caused the problem. So I think that in the, in the setting of a trial, that makes perfect sense. Um, outside of a trial, I would start with the caveat that we don't know because we only have the trials, but we give many other vaccines and we frequently give a couple of vaccines at the same time. And so I think that 
if you want to know which one is giving you the side effects, you should separate them by a couple of weeks, which makes very good sense. But, you know, a priori, there's no good reason I can think of by which uh, one would decrease the efficacy of the other if you give them together. Other panelists, any additional thoughts? Well, I would just add that we wouldn't want folks to choose one over the other either, right? Because it's possible to become infected with both of those viruses at the same time, <laughs> even yes. so. Um, but uh, the flu season hasn't really been um, that impactful this year. Um, but I, I, I suspect we will be having this conversation again in the fall when flu season comes back around. Yes, if we stop for some reason social distancing, the flu will become more of a player. Um, it, yes, it's, it's, it's um, quite surreal and interesting. Uh, I do have a question for all the panelists. It's something we heard, I heard this past week, um, which is not uncommon, right? So you get a vaccine today, the patient comes to you, get a vaccine today. In two days, they get a COVID vaccine, get COVID and test positive. And of course, they're going to go back and say, hmm, that vaccine didn't work. How do you address that? It's, it's happening, actually. So this is not even a theoretical question. I get, yeah, I, I think, uh, Dr. White, so, please. Sure. I was just going to quickly just say, you know, from a, from a practical and pragmatic standpoint, you know, we've been encouraging our patients that um, even after they get the first dose of the vaccine that they need to certainly continue to follow the CDC guidelines on social distancing and wearing masks when they can't um, safely social social distance just because we know that there is a, a, a slight lag time in terms of um, uh, uh, antibody response uh, from the uh, initial vaccine. So from a pragmatic standpoint, we've been uh, encouraging people to, to take that approach. I, I was going to let Dr. Bonaclochi discuss um, when your antibodies, um, you get a response to your immune system at a certain time frame. Yes, as I mentioned before, in the first nine days after you get the vaccine, there's really no difference that you can see between having received the vaccine and having received the placebo. So any infection that happens during those days is um, related to either you got infected before the shot or you get infected after the shot, but before your immune system is able to, to start doing anything that runs in your favor. So um, in the, I would say that if you get the vaccine, uh, don't think that it's going to do anything for you after, until nine, nine days have gone by. <laughs> so and clearly you should never um, stop using your your uh, um, social distancing and hand washing and everything else, because in fact, as some of you who participated in the trials know very well, everybody who participated in the trials were actually doing everything as if they had received the placebo. And that in part explains why the, the rate of COVID infections in the placebo recipients was actually quite low. And I would add, because I think there's a follow-up question to that, um, people may ask um, if that positive test is from the vaccine, and the answer is no. The, the, the test, our PCR test or the antigen test, do not detect antibodies, um, and they do not detect the spike protein, um, that the mRNA, at least for the, the two vaccines that we have. So it is not, if they're testing positive, they have disease. And the other thing that is worth mentioning is that there is nothing alive in these vaccines. So you cannot get COVID from the vaccine. So the same way that you cannot get the flu from the flu shot, you cannot, you cannot get COVID from the mRNA vaccines. So uh, some, some people may think otherwise. Perfect. Dr. Morena. Um, you know, I think the, one of the challenges that we have is how we get um, people from uh, marginalized populations to come in for vaccination. And as things roll out, I, I think it's going to be really challenging to communicate information to them. 
um, get them transportation when necessary because it was hard enough to start with, right? To get them to care. Now we have the pandemic, the scale of the pandemic um, on top of that. Do you have any strategies that uh, clinicians can think of to help their patients? Are there any resources out there to help people to get the vaccination centers, get information to patients? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a really good question. We, um, we were very um, slow and we really failed our communities uh, when COVID first came up to really empower them with, with clear, succinct knowledge that will improve their understanding that will actually affect their behaviors. And um, it, it appears that we got ourselves into a situation when we have to do a lot of uh, remedial type of information so that we can address this and misinformation. Uh, and now we also have to do a lot of remedial innovation so that we can challenge attitudes that people have adopted uh, about these types of things. So uh, really, really the role of uh, providers, the role of clinicians and all the members of our clinical team uh, must really include very actively addressing uh, COVID, COVID prevention and the attitudes towards vaccination uh, in everybody that we, uh, that we see. I'm a psychiatrist. You know, COVID has been huge in psychiatry. People are worried about it. There's a lot of stress associated with it. And even if you just look at retrospective uh, uh, studies on the impact on mental health, new diagnosis and exacerbations of diagnosis, uh, and you compare people with different respiratory conditions and other conditions that are stressful versus COVID, COVID has this uh, ratios of two to one, three to one or more in terms of inducing new conditions. So for us, uh, the vaccination of COVID, it's, it's a preventive intervention for mental health as well. So any one uh, specialty that you all have, if you're not in primary care, uh, take on COVID as part of our responsibilities, our collective responsibilities as clinicians and providers and owners of the health of our communities to make sure that we continue this campaign of creating that awareness and that sense of you guys got to do something about it type of thing that doesn't come across as 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 um, um, as uh, affiliated with a party or a culture or a class that doesn't come across as too paternalistic but rather as the people that can convey trusted and reliable information the team, uh, friend, amigo kind of person that can be in their corner, really coaching and helping out with that. And along with that, recruiting any other community uh, service agencies and, and uh, individuals that can represent that trusted uh, voice. You know, the pastor that you mentioned, uh, the padre in the church, uh, the folks that are not considered to be affiliated with official organizations that may have an agenda that may influence them other than their own well-being and their family. So I'd like to add on to this because this is something that really keeps me up at night. It's, it, it's very bothersome to me because access is a huge issue here. So even those who want to get a vaccine, it may be extremely difficult um, for them to get it. Um, Primarily, uh, well, there's a variety of reasons, but we can't take this vaccine to the community. The vaccine has to be kept extremely cold. And at least in Arizona, we're only offering it in set locations that may not be in the areas where we have our minority um, community patients. So we need, we need all of us to figure out some of those solutions. And while we're trying to figure out those solutions, see if we can rent vans, pile folks in and take them to get vaccines. We have individuals who don't have computers and the way the system has been set up, you have to register on a computer. You have to have internet. You have to, uh, to even get considered. I, I'm very concerned about the fact that we are um, doing 1B and not 1C and 1B, you know, goes to age or 75 and older and the average life expectancy for our minority communities is lower than that. So um, we are still in the back of the line. There's, there's so many issues surrounding um, access that um, 
that, that we still have yet to tackle. So it's another one of those things where Dr. Bonacoche says, we don't know yet, we don't know yet, but it's our responsibility as the community providers to figure it out in partnership with the public health authorities that are actually a little bit overwhelmed right now, but we have to access all of those other community folks and say, this is your problem as well. Be part of the solution. I like what you said, it is our responsibility. It is our responsibility. And it's a lot to ask of our providers. You know, to going back to Dr. Moreno's point, this is a great stress inducer. If it's not doing it psychologically, it's doing it to your wallet, right? Or the emotions related to seeing people die, your neighbors die. There's almost nobody in this country who, unless you're under a rock, who doesn't have knowledge of someone who died of COVID-19 which is incredibly challenging for our providers. The helplessness that many providers in, in our experience have felt, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, that they couldn't really provide care to their patients, especially in the federally qualified health centers without access to telehealth. Very challenging for people. Now we're in a different phase in which we have to now figure out a way to provide vaccination to people who already have burdened with the challenge of getting access to care. And that is still loaded on us. I can tell you that some things I heard to Dr. Marona's point from Arizona this week, uh, the state's Medicaid agency is working to provide access. First of all, vaccination is free. So no one should have to pay for this, right? They may ask for insurance information, but it's not to charge the patients. So please reassure your patients that this vaccination is free when it gets to their turn. Um, a lot of state agencies, and I hope all state agencies, should be providing transportation to patients. And to the extent you have access to them, please plug into your navigation services, community health worker services. Keep in mind, those essential workers are just as burdened as any one of us. But plug into those services so you can get access to it. One complexity that I heard this week was that if you provide transportation, you wait for your turn, you get vaccinated, then you wait to be observed. How do you coordinate that transportation if you're provided by an agency? This is mind boggling. And yet to your point, we can't take this vaccine to people. Once you open it, you have literally finite period of time in which to give it. Enormously challenging. But I want to segue to a question that is in the chat box um once i think what do you know about the johnson and johnson vaccine not sure if anyone has answered that question uh dr Bonacloche, you want to say a brief word about that we can we can also provide this information after the present after this uh, town hall so yeah, I don't know much about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. It's based on uh, on an adenovirus, non, non-replicant adenovirus that was used as a vector for the Ebola vaccine. So it's a, if you want, it's a more tested uh, system than the mRNA vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, it has been in the news in the last couple of days because they have completed enrollment of the large phase three trial with 45,000 people. Um, and then once the, the trial is completed, then we will know about efficacy. So different, completely different kind of vaccine. Um, we'll, uh, we'll see what the results are. Thank you. And uh, this is a question from Melinda Henry. Uh, it's about once you get COVID, do you need to be revaccinated? The answer from me is yes. Again, we don't know. Um, and, and so, and the recommendation is that so you should get vaccinated within the 90 days or so uh, after infection. And so being infected with COVID is not a contraindication to vaccination. Any panelists with contrary views? No, that, that is actually very important to know. A number of people got infected during the trials and didn't know and got the vaccine. And there was no evidence whatsoever of increased toxicity of the vaccine in people who had had the infection prior. Yes. The, the 90 day uh, recommendation comes from the fact that we know 
uh, for what we can measure that for 90 days after having had COVID, you are probably overall immune to COVID, not 100% immune, but fairly immune. And so it's not clear that you gain anything but getting the vaccine the week after you get over COVID. Why don't enjoy the immunity that the real infection provides you for the next three months and then after three months, get your shot. That's one way of thinking about that. But some of my patients have gone and received the, the COVID vaccine a couple of weeks after getting over COVID. And, um, you know, that's, uh, there, there's no contraindication. And please, we implore our audience to stick with us. We do have a post-test. Kidding. Well, we do have some poll questions that will like your perspective, and um, uh, please do share your questions, uh, even if we're not able to answer them. But we do have two questions on the uh, Q and A that I like to read out. The first one is about um, experience about collaborating with places of work where mostly minority patients may be employed to bring the immunization there. Um, Dr. Chapital, you're shaking your head and. Ivan, you guys can take this and Francisco can chime in as well. I was just going to, going to say yes. That's that's what that's the kind of creative thinking that we need, um, those yes. ideas. Um, uh, have we done it yet? No, we have not done that yet, but that's what we need to do. And let's advocate for it too. Mm -hmm. We need to advocate for it. And this is something we have to advocate for. We can't sit by. All I would add is just, um, you know, uh, really good for us to be able to not have to pit groups against one another. So the more the vaccine we can get, get out of freezers, maybe we can stop three and four thousand people leaving a day. So the more vaccines we yeah. can get out, the more we will be able to be creative with ideas such as this. And, and you know, that, that's those first steps got to happen. We got to get vaccines out of freezers. Yeah. And also, I think some of the vaccines are more portable than others, and that may provide you know, the ability to do that. Uh, Francisco? Yeah, so I think um, absolutely. We, we are like flashing. We're looking for the keys where the lights are right now. We're delivering uh, the vaccine where it's feasible and convenient. Uh, but also, it, it, you know, we, we fortunately prioritize certain communities. So I guess we are doing a pretty reasonable job with this. Uh, but uh, as Dr. Chapito mentioned, we must really get out there. Dr. Porter also mentioned, we gotta have the vaccine to go out there. In our community, there has been a redeployment of spots where these vaccines are going to be given. And now we have selected some areas of town where the, the zip codes that had a lot more people from disadvantaged uh, uh, backgrounds are now uh, spots where a lot of the vaccine will be deployed to. And I think it's very, very important, this idea of going to the places where people work or this, the, the parts of town. Um, you know, I grew up in Mexico and I remember the vaccination campaigns. People were coming, the nurses were coming, the neighbors were coming. And it was like, no, uh, you're gonna get it. And, and it's very different to, to be interacting with, uh, mm -hmm. with the community members that are really representing you, your people that you trust and whatnot. So this is when having that community congruent, linguistically congruent and, and sort of um, um, uh, one of us, one of you are the same thing kind of uh, uh, exchanges is what really can be a lot more impactful because you can show up at a place of work where there's minority individuals, and if they think you're from the government or that you're gonna get their numbers or you're gonna ask for IDs or for socials or, or insurance cards, they're gonna run in all kinds of different directions. Um, but again, uh, trusted people, representative of the trusted communities uh, right. can be a, a great strategy. The message is clear. We need to get the people where they are to the extent that technology or the vaccines allow us to do so. And that has to be part of a strategy to get people vaccinated. To Dr. not Dominique, repeat, I, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Dr. I'm Ward. sorry, yeah, if I may, um, Dr. Dominique. So I think that, you know, as important as our role is as primary care providers in, you know, um, speaking to this issue of vaccine hesitancy, I think that all it really would take in a clinic or within a local community, you know, or one or two, you know, really empowered and energized community champions to really help accelerate 
um, the, 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 and diminish the resistance to, to vaccine hesitancy among communities. So I, you know, I encourage our, our attendees and, and us as providers, you know, that if you have a patient that is able to get the vaccine, you know, and, and um, you know, really is, is interested in trying to help spread the word, you know, to leverage that, to, to you know, to, to put on the forefront, you know, their experience and their, their, uh, their voice uh, to really help sort of accelerate that, that spread within the community. Because I think, you know, individual who have, can come alongside the healthcare team uh, can really take the message a long way. All right. On that note, I am being told to move things along. Um, it, this is a moment we've been waiting for. So thank you everyone for this excellent panel. We're going to pause for just a moment for the uh, pop-up poll questions to come up and uh, we'll get those uh, questions <clears> answered <throat> and then um, I will come back. So please uh, look at the poll and put in your responses, everyone. Thank you so much. One thing that I would like to mention, because we haven't discussed it while people send their, their polls, is there's another group that don't want to get vaccinated, not particularly because they are minorities or um, because they don't uh, necessarily, because they are marginalized or because they are on the, on the edges of society. Um, there are young people who have their math wrong and they think that because they are young and their likelihood of having a bad outcome from COVID is lower than if they are old, they don't need to get vaccinated. And I wonder if, uh, if Dr. Moreno would comment on whether appealing to the altruism of people and explaining that there are vaccines that you get for yourself and vaccines that you should get for the benefit of the community is a strategy that can be used to convince some of these um, uh, younger skeptics? You know, that's a very good uh, question. I don't really know the answer to that. So I'm going to pull a Dr. Benacloche on you. And uh, I don't have the data to support that. But I'll tell you, um, we're part of a couple of other large initiatives that draw in a lot of people to participate in research that doesn't have a direct benefit to the individual that receive, uh, that participates in the research. And altruism is definitely a very common uh, draw in the Hispanic community and in the African American community to participate in research. Um, and um, uh, sometimes people do it for their kids or the next generation or things of that nature. Um, but uh, in this case, it, it should be even better than that because people have a direct benefit. We, we need to make sure we, everybody understand the importance of that benefit and it's through our own protection that we also serve the needs of others. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we've come to about 6.30 and uh, I want to again thank the panelists for such a wonderful and lively and informative session about COVID vaccine. I want to thank our audience uh, participants for a very active role in sharing your questions and thoughts with us. Um, I think there was a last question in the chat that um, um, was there. Uh, we don't know the answer to that question, but I think this week I, I remember reading that the Moderna CEO saying something we all know already, that we may be living with COVID vaccine, COVID for the foreseeable future. So this may be a life adjusting experience for us. Again, we will look at any questions we haven't answered and shared with you. Uh, we do have upcoming uh, town halls uh, that will also share additional information. There's one that uh, uh, Marion is going to be in um, Spanish as well. On February 4th, we will have the town hall uh, in Spanish only. Okay. And so we do ask you to share the information with people. We want these sessions to be informative and useful to people. If you have any feedback for us, please share with us so we can do better. But I've really enjoyed and learned a lot. And I want to thank each and every one of you, but also Fahia Omar, who has been the 
So there'll be heavy lifting behind all of these events, but also Ray for the technical support. It seemed to have gone completely flawlessly. And so I appreciate that. Please stay safe. We urge you to get vaccinated. If you have questions, by all means, please share your concerns. For your patients, I encourage you to uh, answer their questions in a non-judgmental way, because I think that's more likely to get them to trust the information you share. And uh, we believe that is uh, important to share the information transparently. Even if you're hesitant, I think it's important to also share that information with the patients. And again, uh, good night, everyone, and stay safe. And we hope to see you in future town halls. Night.